So today we're going to be working on another MacBook. Let's open up this MacBook and see if it can be fixed. This is an A1708 MacBook, non-touch bar, USB-C model that is not turning on. If you're looking for some complete disrespect, check out this screen. Here you can buy a screen for an A1150 or A1211 MacBook Pro. A perfect birthday present for a friend or significant other who wants a fluorescently backlit screen that has a proper EDID code so their A1150 or H1211 ATI Radeon X1600 base MacBook can have a proper screen again. It'll be signed with a loving message from Lewis Rossman. May or may not include lyrics to ha Tool's message to Harry Manback. The first thing we're going to do here is unplug the battery. Because the battery is going to take a different amount of amperage depending on how charged it is which is going to mess up my readings. So the first thing that I do when I'm diagnosing this is I plug it in to the charger and then with this little USB-C amp meter and this is going to tell me how much power the board is taking but if the board is also delivering power to the battery then we're going to have two separate variables that we're measuring at the same time which means we're actually measuring nothing. I want to know how much power the board is taking by itself not the board plus the battery. So this board is able to make its way to 20 volts which means the CD3215 chips are communicating with the charger. On these machines, the CD3215 chips are the USB-C MUXs. They need to communicate with the charger in order to tell the charger, I'm not a cell phone, I'm a, I'm a GoPro, I'm a MacBook. I want 20 volts, not five. And that's clearly being done. But the zero amp draw means that either our power rolls are not being told to come on, or there is a dead short circuit that's, t and one of the chips is uh, noticing that there's a dead short circuit and deciding not to create any power for the machine. The only way to figure that out would be to take this board out of the case and go from there. All right, so the first thing we're going to check is our PP bus. Now, PP3V3 underscore G3 hot is the first rail we need for this to work. However, we already have that because we're getting 20 volts in the charger. In order to get 20 volts in the charger, these two chips need to be able to communicate with the charger, and these two chips are powered by PP3V3 underscore G3 hot. So we have that. So the first rail we're going to check is see if we have PP bus G3 hot, because that's the rail that everything else is going to be created from. And down here, we take a look, and we see that we've got zero. Zero volts. And now what we're going to do is we're going to see if we have a short to ground on our PP bus. 0.5 ohms. So now before we go crazy trying to figure out, you know, like if, if there's um, a short that we can detect on the thermal camera, I just want to look at the board itself and see if there's anything obvious. Because if there's an obvious thing that's causing the short circuit, like let's say a, a capacitor that's clearly exploded, that saves me a step of having to go back to the office and steal Camille's thermal camera and plug it in and all that good stuff. So. We're going to turn on our good old handy dandy microscope camera, which I am very happy to have. This is the last one that I can find that has this tube. See this? If you buy any other camera from Amscope or Omano at the, or microscope.com or Amscope or any other company, it has that really long microscope tube uh, tri on the trinocular port, and it sucks. The image quality has a vignetting, it has the chromatic abrasions, it's, just, it's out of focus in certain areas and not in others. Just, it, it's not the same as this. I've tried so many things to get it good. This is beautiful. I love this one. But this one will not fit on the newer microscopes that I get from them, even if it's the same model. But this one over here, oh, beautiful. One of a kind. I'm never letting Kevin let somebody steal this. Never. Never. It's my microscope camera. Okay, I cannot see any obviously exploded capacitor. Or I see. Hmm, is that? No, yeah, that's not. Thank you, Nash, for the five dollars, by the way. I have several air purifiers, actually. I have, I have two alive air purifiers and two other ones in the store and I change them as often as I can. The thing is, I don't know where the dead rat smell is coming from. And Nell, have you found where the dead rat smell is coming from? <laughs> no, but I'm smelling it again. Yes. Can you perhaps figure out I where that... <laughs> can you find the dead rat, in Nell? I just found the basement, too. What if it's not here, but it's, uh, there's somebody, a homeless man died in the basement? No, because this happened to me before. Not the homeless man dying in the basement. Did I ever tell you the, the basement story? No. All right, so there was a, So I went downstairs. No, I, I had this thing open, and I had the gate open, and I started to stream. And I noticed, oh, crap, the basement's open. I lock it. And then I come back out about four or five hours later when I'm done with a long stream, and, the, and I hear banging. And then I open. He's like, you locked me down there! And I said, you broke into my fucking basement, asshole. 
I, I, I don't check my basement to see if there's a homeless man sleeping in it. Hope you... It's the same thing Oreo does. I tell him, don't go in the closet. Don't go in the closet. I open the closet to get my jacket. He runs in. I close the door. And then I have to come home. And he's going, row, row, row. It's like, you fucking moron. I told you not to go in the closet. We've been over this every single day for two years. But yeah. So make sure there's no homeless person down there. Also, take a box cutter with you in case the homeless person down there has a weapon. Or at least a nice sharp set of tweezers. Yeah, I was just saying, let me get that knife. Don't trust it. There we go. And that was a trooper. All right, so I'm not finding anything obvious on here. So we're going to turn on the power supply that I fixed the other day. Had to make sure to make my credibility back from that little uh, internet warrior fuckface that said I don't have credibility because I don't know everything. So we fixed that power supply in the proper manner. And now I am going to put that on my board. I'm going to put a volt into the... I'm going to put one volt into PP bus and see what comes out. Actually, one thing we can do, so check this out. This is a good trick. So I'm, I only invested 0.8 volts into that, which even if the CPU MOSFET was short, it would be fine. So I'm going to check my resistance between my PP bus G3 hot and my CPU coils. So remember, so 3.6 ohms to ground. So remember, PP bus is short, it's a ground. CPU V core is always going to be a very low resistance to ground, but at least it's high enough that I don't think it's something too terrible. 3.6 ohms is good, so we're not directly shorted. So if that was zero, then I would say CPU MOSFETs are what is shorted to PP bus, and that's what's causing our issue, but it's not. Now, I don't feel like walking to the back of the store to get the, the thermal cam. I'm being really lazy. So what I'm going to do is, you know what I'm going to do. <clears throat> How come you don't work in the back of the store? Because I don't. That's because I don't. Because I work up here. That's why. Okay, so. Anything obviously shorted. Ooh, I see smoke. Pretty, pretty small. Look at that. Z Compact Pro requires no walking to the back. Yeah, but um, that requires money. I broke. I spent all my money on data recovery stuff. No more money. I'm out of money. Okay, which one of these caps is it? I'm pretty sure that it's the one all the way on the right. Because the, if you notice, the capacitor all the way on the right is the one that has no like liquid on it. So I, every time I do this, the liquid heats away from those caps, but it's totally gone from this one. So here we're going to see how the hot tweezers are at fixing that. I'm going to just turn off the voltage. And let's see how long it takes. I'm going to So the tweezers just beeped. I'm holding it up like this. Let's see how long it takes for the cap to come off and the board to drop. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is one of the reasons I hate hot tweezers. Look at this, look at this. One, two, three, four. Useless piece of shit. How the fuck does Jesse use those is beyond me. Fuck hot tweezers. And you may say that's a big component, point taken, but it does that even with 0402, is it drives me up a fucking wall. One, two, yoink. It's fuck hot tweezers. Alright, you got the rest of that capacitor that I knocked off over there. And we got rid of any of the junk left over on the pad. Now we get ourselves a donor board and replace that capacitor with a better one. A fitter. Happier.
More product. The Lewis upgrade to Threadripper 2. Are you effing kidding me? I spent 3,000 bucks on this one already. Hell no. I wound up spending three or four hundred dollars on water cooling that actually worked. No, th this system is far too high end already. It gets 25,000 to 26,000 on CPU Benchmark. So if you go to CPU Benchmark's website, you'll see that my Threadripper 2950X is a 25,000 score. My old machine, it was a Core i7 5820K or 5720 or 5930, I forget. It was the 6 core 3.3 gigahertz Haswell. Whichever one was the 6 core 3.3 gigahertz Haswell. It was about a, a 12 or a 13,000. I think it was like 11 or 12,000 on there. So I typically do not upgrade my CPU until the score on CPU benchmark is a full double of what it was in the old one. Because if it's not twice as fast, then I'm putting a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of money into it for no reason. That's why I really don't get people that are constantly constantly upgrading. They're, they're always looking at these benchmarks all the time. Because there was, there was a time where every... In a, year to 18 months you were getting some genuine really cool improvements and now that just doesn't exist anymore you know you can it it took five years after i bought that processor to get twice the performance and you have to keep in mind that that doubling of the performance also came at three times the price so my the six core haswell 3.3 gigahertz that i got i bought that for 340 or 350 dollars in free shipping at the time Whereas the Threadripper, it, that one cost me over $900. So after five years, you still had to pay three times as much money than you did five years ago in order to get twice the performance. So I'm not really excited. I don't up, I'm not excited about upgrading stuff at all. It, there's no real, there's no reason for it. The amount of money that you have to spend to get an upgrade where you're really going to notice a genuine difference you have to spend a stupid amount of money. Now, if there's some sort of system out there where I could have, you know, four Xeon CPUs, and if I could have four Xeon CPUs in one machine, then sure, I would do it. You know, like if I had, or if I had the money to get four Xeon CPUs in one computer, then I could see, you know, you buy the best Xeon there is, you buy four of them, that's an upgrade. But this incremental stuff, like, this, there's, there's no excitement to me. It's like, I used to have a 25,000 benchmark score, and now, I have a 26,000 CPU benchmark score. No. No. Boring. And as can be seen here, it is taking 500 milliamps, which means it is turning on and working. So it just had one bad capacitor. We were able to find the short without use of the thermal camera just by injecting voltage using our power supply. And remember, if you do have a short circuit on PPBush G3 Hot, I would check if you have a short circuit between PPBush G3 Hot and the coils of any of the other power supplies. The reason I would do that is let PPBush G3 Hot is the power rail that is going to be responsible for creating all the other power rails. So these systems are going to have PP5VS5, PP5VS4, PPF5VS3, PP3V3S3, PP3V3SO, PP1V8SO, PP, uh, the V core, CPU V core. So all the main power rails in the machine are created using this line that is 12 volts. So let's say one of the high side MOSFETs that does the switching. So it says, okay, 12 volts now, no 12 volts, 12 volts now, no 12 volts, 12 volts now, no 12 volts. To create a smaller power line like the 5 volts of the 3 volt line, let's say that one of those is shorted. So it's always on. You don't want to put voltage into your PP bus, which is 12 volts. And if your 12 volts is shorted to your 5 volt line or your 3 volt line or your 1 volt line. Because then whatever voltage you injected in is now going to be going directly into those lower rails, which is why I stick to a voltage that is lower than the lowest rail when I'm injecting. So even though I do make that measurement to make sure that my main power line, my PP by G3 hot, is not shorted to any of the other coils, what I do is I also make sure that the voltage in the power supply is that of the lowest rail in the machine. So let's say CPU V core is 0.9 volts. Just in case PP bus is shorting to everything, I make sure that I set the power supply to 0.8 volts and try to find the short that way. This way, even if I do a mismeasurement or make a mistake, and PP bus G3 hot is shorted through another power line or through another FET, I'm not skull fucking the entire machine. So uh, let me just see if this gives us a picture on the screen. Okay, and this light is actually blowing out the light of the MacBook, so you can't see that there's a question mark folder there. See? Question mark folder. And if I boot it into the operating system, I'd be able to raise the brightness. So this board has been fixed. It just needed that one little capacitor knocked off of the board. Another machine saved from the Genius Bar. Another machine saved from the hands 
of this individual. Just because the light is green does not mean somebody is not going to run in front of it like that set of top hats. Or this set of top hats. Oh, target 